हरे कृष्ण श्यामानंद प्रभु हरे कृष्ण बैक टूडे वॉट टॉपिक वुड यू लाइक टू डिस्कस टूडे प्रभु सो इन आवर लास्ट पॉडकास्ट वेन वी गॉट सम ऑडियंस फीडबैक we have debra chans i think she's from our chicago group yes the ones uh, uh, who visited india and yeah. uh, she was very happy with the animals and their place in a eco conscious world and uh, she has uh, volunteered to uh, like an, give us an idea uh, and i can really understand why she could be interested the please discuss arranged marriages <laughs> it is kind of strange that uh, two monks are discussing arranged marriage uh, i would like at the very outset to uh, tell our audience that uh, although we are both in india and our activities also are in india we also both go outside india you more so me only in uh, in united states but we want we would like to give any educated person of non indian uh origin who might be feeling a bit intrigued or curious as to how come indians still have this system of arranged marriage although it could be on the vein what could be your view point uh, is arranged marriage kind of looked down upon or uh, Uh, is it on the decrease in india hmm yeah, that that is true see you know we could talk about it from a if you are presenting indian spirituality and as a indian spiritu- or senior spiritual expressed through indian culture then whatever questions come about or uh, about that culture we need to address them hmm so it's a important point mm. so uh, maybe we could have some kind of framework to have the discussion do you have something in mind i like that uh, three uh, categories of like three umbrella points for discussion which you had uh, sent a few days ago maybe we could just go over all three of them quickly and then we can take them one by one okay so i, I thought of first the discussing you know why does instead of when we ask why is something there so instead of that we could turn the question and ask and why does we why do we find its presence objectionable so why why does right. uh, arranged marriage seem wrong or seem objectionable then how did it work in the past and then how its underlying principles uh, are relevant even today even if the specifics change all right so how it worked in the pa- uh, or why we find it objectionable there is uh, to some extent a significant break in uh, human self conception that happened in the especially in the since the advent of modernity and early modernity we could say in the post enlightenment where uh, enlightenment is in western intellectual history the phase which came after the scientific revolution when it is thought that ma- that humanity woke up from the many superstitions and dogmas that it was bound to in the past so it's used in point point a particular number which century let's say 15th or 16th for them no, not definitely not 15 16th so basically 16th century was the uh, the reformation 17th century uh, uh, 16th century was the renaissance 17th century was the reformation 18th century onward the scientific revolution started so we could say from the 19th 20th centuries onward now again this is because it's not that these events happen at the same time all over the world we are oh, talking right. about very broad historical epochs and uh, <clears throat> rather than focusing on the specifics we could focus on the principle that um, what happened is in the past human society was quite structured and everybody had their roles in society and there was a greater uh, emphasis on duty than on autonomy that okay i am in this role and this is the duty that i have to do i am expected to do and uh, autonomy in in the sense that we talk about today you know this is the career i want to pursue 
this is the kind of things i want to do that is the kind i want to do that is the kind of things i want to do this was it, it was not that people were deprived of it it is that that was not there in the in the cultural landscape itself so as like can we say that people in the 15th 16th centuries missed having uh, youtube and netflix or smartphones and uh, internet no it is nobody had that at that time so they didn't miss it uh, and so the idea is that on one side we need freedom we need autonomy but on other side we also need duty and responsibility so in the past the effect, the the focus was more on responsibility or duty rather than on autonomy what this meant practically is that people would not be so much uh, uh, it is people were not so much caught in what i like to do or it is more focus on what i need to do in this particular situation what is it that i need to do and it life was also tough it is material comfort if we can call it that way came only recently in the 20th century and uh, people started thinking more about other things so it is not just it was not just marriage but also one's career choice if one was born in a particular family whether it was in the west or in the east more or less their family profession would be what people would be uh, would be uh, taking and even physical mobility was limited so now today we might find that very uh, restrictive and regressive but there is not much evidence that people at that time felt like that because there was no reference point and today if we see there's too much autonomy can also lead to confusion that there is so much uh, confusion among people about which career to choose and even today it's not that people are with all the autonomy to choose a career people are always satisfied with the career that they have and so we don't want to undermine the importance of autonomy but the way autonomy or individual choice is almost like a unquestioned value in today's world it was not like that and therefore the the idea of uh, somebody else arranging things for us including one's marriage that is that we seems very regressive today where it's somebody interfering in our life it was not seen like that in the past any thoughts on this yeah i i'm really attracted to this uh, angle of looking at things the autonomy versus uh right to choose oh sorry autonomy versus uh, responsibility or duty yeah when we say that people were not necessarily comfortable or they didn't have suddenly if today we have sociology they would say they didn't have the luxuries they didn't have the comfort they didn't have and you know what they would say they didn't have so many channels on tv they didn't have so many uh, disneyland uh, alternatives they didn't have uh the like in mumbai we have the sl world water playground or so that needs to be questioned that just that we have more avenues for amusement hmm do we mean to say that we are getting that much entertained because there is a big hiatus there's a big gap between the availability of entertainment and the quality of your heart or mind after you have consumed that entertainment yes so true. like you said there could be no youtube there could be no netflix just two days ago i glanced uh, in one newspaper online it said that uh, the storytellers of this particular town they are out of job previously they would just uh, entertain the audience and people would throng around them every evening so today a person would be smug and secure in his or her own apartment in sitting in front of a big plasma screen and ordering a particular program from netflix and then afterward that same person goes to a psychiatric or a psychologist or reads a self help book as to how do i learn the art of talking to someone so that i can get my views across without being judgmental how do i make friends well if you have 10000 ways of amusing yourself why do you still need a friend and this kind of friendship or whatever was easily available in the 
those days where people would just throng around a particular storyteller and you, it was a person to person it was a uh, like a real natural authentic kind of feeling so coming to this point that i am now making a statement that i'm sorry i lost you more comforting to a young girl or a young boy in those days when arranged marriages were so called predominant in india or even outside india would it comfort that young person that this important decision i don't need to take a rash decision because i may not be able to take a proper decision but someone else whom i trust some elderly person my parents or someone of the age of my parents or the village or community elders they could help me in coming to a decision yeah so so now you are talking about one other point see one is that whether i i talked about autonomy itself was not as much valued in the past as it was today another point is that that there was a sense that uh, others may know what i need equally as well if not more the, better than what i know yes now, so yes i think uh, that tendency to to at least somewhat respect the previous generation one of the defining differences i noticed uh, that, that that historian that is history field of history of ideas and they say one of the defining differences between the modern and the pre modern civilizations is that the pre modern civilizations whether it is india or the middle east or the west europe or whatever they generally look at their past with veneration whereas modernity because of the idea of evolution and progress treats looks at the past with with at least some level of condescension and that is reflected even through generations that almost every generation will have some generation gap and some generational conflicts but the idea of deference to one's elders that is much more in uh, that was uh, much more there in the past and that is quite conspicuous by its uh, by its uh, minimization if not just uh, elimination in today's world so that 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 is also a societal factor which will contribute to this this is a very good point in the sense that let us get rid of something which is old only because it is old yes i think i, I we discussed this in a one of our earlier podcast that uh, it's what is the difference between a liberal and a conservative so if both of them purchase a field and in that field they see that a fence has been constructed so a liberal says hey this fence is coming in my way let me destroy it and a conservative says that okay this fence is here somebody must have constructed it for some reason so let me find out why they constructed it and maybe that reason is not valid today and maybe then i should remove it but let me first find out why it is there so of course we could say that it's a, this is generalized it is gen- all generalization not true always but that that is a good example of uh, the same point which you are saying just because something is existing doesn't make it intrinsically good doesn't make it intrinsically bad but at least evaluate it based, based on its merit so but if we just uh, cursory reject it i think that is not healthy yes yeah so so now this uh, this leads to that further point that even when somebody would get married so we would say that uh, our arranged marriage is likely to be uh, happier or unhappier so can we go to the second sec- next point now how arranged marriage works in the past yeah first we thought uh, you said we will take the opposite view can you just repeat that once again so that's what i said that why do we find arranged marriage is objectionable that's because we value autonomy in a way that was not valued so much in the past so All the right. so the reason why we find it objectionable people in the past might not have found it objectionable that way so you are saying that culturally with today's lens we are unable to understand that particular scenario unless unless we put a cultural lens which was appropriate at that time yes perfect so 
each age has certain things which it values and we are not going we are not here uh, evaluating the values per se but we are acknowledging the values per se right for at the very basic level so evaluating another culture by by today's culture's values uh, that at least has to be done with certain level of circumspection now we are not talking entirely about cultural relativism that that every culture will have its values and there is absolutely no overarching criteria there are definitely you could we could say values that are universal and we could almost call them transcultural uh in the sense that they they apply for humanity at all times but say for uh, but specifically the autonomy is important no nobody want, nobody would want to be a slave for example but the degree of autonomy that is sought in today's world and the idea that autonomy would bring greater autonomy will bring greater happiness that presumption was not there in the past so so that was the first point now yeah, we move on to the yeah, second so, so the second point is you know so in this overall society where people were focused more so more on duty than on autonomy you now whatever was done so like somebody had a job even today people differentiate between having a job and having a career so having a job is basically something which you use to earn a living having a, now terms can be different but having a career is said to be fair somebody is actually passionate about the field that they work in and they want to flourish in that field hmm. so <clears throat> people had their uh, jobs people did their work and some of sometimes they were they loved it sometimes they didn't love it but there is a sense of duty which was there and because of that they continued it and especially if one is in a supportive community which also uh, works together so then then the the duty doesn't become that much of a burden so i would say then that the job doesn't become that much of a burden so same way marriage was more a uh, obligation or a duty rather than simply a choice it was uh, like nowadays many people uh, there is a antinatalism movement which says that you know that uh, the world is such a place of misery that why do we why should we beget children at all mm? now this doesn't mean that they people want uh, sexual abstinence but they want to artificially cut off uh having pro- uh, reproduction so in the past uh, continuing one's uh, dynasty was a very important responsibility in fact we see so many kings would go to great extents to try to get a heir and they would sometimes do sacrifices and other things so that idea of continuing that now pleasure was obviously one concern but pleasure was not the sole concern and because the sense of duty was there so pleasure would uh, or because a sense of ple- pleasure would get subordinated to that sense of duty and sense of responsibility that is uh, broadly my understanding your thoughts on this yeah just like to uh, further the discussion that we agreed that there was more a sense of uh, duty that sense of duty also permeated uh, like a person's mindset like for a girl it would be uh, like in hindi they would call her paraya dhan or would call her you are someone else's property today a girl might rebel at the thought that you are treating me like a property you are treating me like some object but if you read between the lines it was never like women were not objectified in that sense although i know there are people who talk about the mahabharata and whether draupadi was objectified or whatever whether sita was objectified in the ramayana just to put aside those things for a moment but look at uh, look at the point where she is told that you would be heading another household you could be through the process of procreation you could be starting a new dynasty the values and attitude of a whole uh, lineage will depend upon you how you keep the household happy content satisfied there were religious norms which were supposed to be followed that was the responsibility of a girl now i am taking talking 
mainly from the angle of arranged marriage means we, we talk of females who may be angered that why arranged marriage let us take the uh, angle of a boy who would be told that your marriage is already arranged and this is a very good family and this girl will suit your nature because we know her so today what someone is doing on his or her own through some dating sites or whatever it's a vast desert out there now there are certain examples i always see the guardian uk online newspaper they always show those cases where online dating worked and then i see best sellers which talk in terms of how that dating doesn't work so obviously for one or two cases where it works there could be dozens or hundreds where it simply doesn't work so that also is a is a truth so continuing your line of thought in the terms of duty a young person would feel it is my duty to take care of this particular whether it's a warrior administrator that is a kingdom whether it's a vaishya then a particular mercantile occupation or someone lower than that even some of the things like being a copper blacksmith or uh, i mean a cobbler a blacksmith a goldsmith whatever this particular arrangement took away a major source of stress on the part of the individual and i would say that that stress was taken as a sense of duty by the elders that it is not just like today somebody might say due to this arranged marriage i have fulfilled the selfish obligation selfish aspirations of someone else while my aspirations are simply demolished or neglected or whatever and therefore i should make my own choice because nobody else can make a better choice than me this particular i would say feeling was absent during those times true true so you know just uh, i would say two points about this that it's so important to recognize that humanity has survived for many many generations and many many millennia and uh, the very fact that uh, life is life is tough that there is a struggle for existence and uh, the fact that humanity has survived means that we did something right hmm? so in sometimes we might look back one way to challenge this idea of that in the past people were not so progressive and we are progress we are more progressed now well we could we can talk in terms of technology definitely there's progress but at the same time we can taking that same argument around we can say that uh, the external supports in terms of technology technological comforts and facilities were not there in the past so so in one sense for people in the past life was much tougher and although life was tougher people did survive people not not only survive people also um, i mean human society continued on so that means they got something right otherwise how would they survive so there was some kind of social what the term often uses is social capital that there was something in the larger community that one was a part of which supported people and by which they were able to live and they were able to move forward so one of the things was the stability of the family unit and now i i i would say that whether the some relationships work through dating or not uh, or through online dating or whatever the point ultimately comes is that for any relationship to work there has to be a shift from seeking autonomy to accepting duty and responsibility if that shift is not there then no relationship is going to be sustainable so if somebody somebody is uh, doing to do something simply for pleasure if we consider say like one's job if now there might be some area which i really enjoy but even in area which i enjoy it's not going to be always enjoyable for me and unless I, there is a sense of duty or responsibility a person who likes a particular profession will also not be able to persevere in that profession and same way 
without that sense of duty or responsibility even if is one is a relationship with someone one one likes still there will be phases when there will be difficulties so the sense of responsibility is important so i wouldn't want to categorically say that how relationships start alone are going to determine whether they are going to be successful or not so they may start with a basis of a, a basis of arrangement by elders or they may start based on one's individual choice but the key thing is without an ethos of responsibility uh, neither will continue and in the starting with say the arranged marriages the idea was that the, the ethos of doing a duty or taking a responsibility was what stressed in the beginning itself because eventually that has to come for any relationship to continue in fact for any social role to be done discharged responsibly any thoughts on this okay so before we go on to the third and final part of our discussion i am in no way kind of living in the past i'm not trying to tell any of our audience uh, listeners that it worked 100% we are just trying to make an assessment of what this institution is arranged marriage how it worked whether something can be done to make it work now which is a big gray area and uh, we will shortly go into that so i would now like to address where it would fail so i may be making a broad generalization but whenever something kind of stinks of selfishness mm. but it is cloaked or masked as duty so a young person is forced into a marriage and outward answer given is that this will be good for you or this will be good for our business or this is a political alliance and which would give us commercial profit or whatever later and then when the relationship suffers or when the original intent is out then like once bitten twice shy so then the whole experience kind of percolates throughout society and then generation after generation the like bad news travel fast so in that sense people come to know that hey you know that person's arranged marriage was done with this intent but actually this was the real intent and then slowly there is a snowballing effect mm. there is one novel written by leo tolstoy called anna karenina yes. and it is something like 600 750 pages of just the mental torment of one woman whose marriage whose i don't think she's in marriage but it's like a loveless marriage and she's stuck into it and tolstoy really goes uh, it takes so much pains to make the reader understand her emotions so i was the uh, reading one online uh, uh, classics literature blog and someone said uh, this teacher was teaching that and a student said why make such a big fuss i mean why write 700 pages on the torment of a woman caught in a loveless marriage she could have just taken a divorce in a day what's the big issue about that so the the teacher was sympathetic to tolstoy's cause so he or she i don't know who it was but that teacher gave a response which was kind of partial to tolstoy's understanding hmm. that he said yes from today's point of view this whole novel is meaningless because today if you just don't want something you just move out of it and then you have all the freedom not to continue or to go to dozen more such matrimonial alliances it's up to you so here again one of my favorite jk chesterton's quotation chesterton when he heard that the divorce law is going to be so liberalized he quipped my only fear is that frivolous divorce will give rise to frivolous marriage and that was very prescient that was he said that and right now we see so 
we also we, we are trying to analyze a particular societal institution but we also should be aware that what are the costs of it so i think this is a segue into our third discussion that should we like i'm not saying that we do have the power to foster it or encourage it but just for the sake of discussion yeah what stands would you take i think your third point was what can we do to make sense of it today right what was the yeah. what did you what the underlying values yeah important even today okay so please you can so, continue on that yeah but i think uh, i started on that direction already when i said that for any relationship to work or any vocation also to work just the pleasure per pleasure motive will not sustain one has to have a sense of duty or responsibility to be able to sustain what one is doing so in that regard my understanding would be twofold first is that there is when we talk about uh, marriages the focus is on how it started and that's important and if that if that comes out uh, uh, wrong or in the sense that people are hugely incompatible it is going to be a problem but more important than how it started is what sustains it and quite often it's like we say that there are there is there is there are three phases there is creation maintenance and destruction so even if we consider in terms of say companies many times people who are very good at startups so they can start a company and make it big but they are not the people who can sustain the company for long and quite often people who make the startup they start it and then after that they if they try to keep it on it becomes it, they they lose money so they often sell it off and the people who maintain who are able to maintain companies and lead them into long somewhat long term uh, uh, prosperity they are often not the people who started those companies so now there could be a few exceptions but in general startup requires a different set of uh, skills starting a company requires a sense of uh, adventure a sense of uh, of uh, a greater emphasis on creativity whereas maintaining a company requires a greater emphasis on continuity so creativity is always required in a sense but the emphasis differs so this whole discussion of marriages uh, it focuses i feel too much on how something started and okay if there is an initial attraction yes that could be a plus point but is that attraction going to be sustained throughout the life if that is there's no guarantee of that if it's if it's largely a biological attraction then it's going to wane over a time so i feel that if we consider not so much how a marriage starts but we look at what are the values that will make a marriage sustainable and we are talking about not just about marriage it could be any kind of anything that we need to do which is sustainable then that's where um, the idea of duty and responsibility come in much more than say autonomy or pleasure any thoughts on this just a uh, one liner from a i don't know which friend of mine told that he said you fall in love and get married or you get married and then fall in love yeah that's true <laughs> <laughs> i don't know who said that hmm i've heard this also so going back to that earlier quote you made about you know frivolous divorces will encourage frivolous marriages now it's going in the opposite direction that rather than have frivolous marriages because even now there is a certain amount of gravity to the idea of marriage so traditionally marriages were associated with some kind of uh, religious authorization religious sanctification uh, of course there was some legal legal obligation also involved over there so now what is happening is that while there might be greater autonomy the flip side of autonomy is insecurity if i alone am responsible for my decisions or if i alone have to make decisions then i alone am responsible for the consequences of those decisions and then 
to the extent we have freedom to that extent we also have to bear the consequences so what happens is that a so i think that that was causes a lot of anxiety also and uh, yes rather than simply saying that a particular form is what was done in the past and that's why it should be done in the future could say okay this particular form worked in the past and this was the reason it worked so why it worked was that there was an underlying sense of duty and underlying sense of uh, of uh, commitment so that sense is required even in today's world for making anything work so i think that underlying value is important mm. so that is my quick thought on this yeah just a quick another quick thought that uh today's sociologists and psychologists are also alarmed that a broken marriage kind of perpetuating is a heavy word but it kind of duplicates itself somebody coming from a broken marriage is twice or thrice likely to have a broken marriage in his or her own life and in this way uh like the misery simply compounds people have resigned to the fact that i have to as, as you said so much of over emphasis on the pleasure principle of how much pleasure i am getting and uh, it's not like it's a conscious decision but in the absence of spiritual culture you keep yourself in the center for everything in your life mm. and the yardstick for measuring the value of anything is the pleasure that i derive from it now you may disagree with some scriptural tenets or whatever but you can't disagree with some principles that ultimately material pleasure is number one having a shelf life and it is minuscule in nature and your ability to squeeze is also limited so whatever it could be whether it is movies or sports or uh, any kind of entertainment how much you can squeeze from it whether it is even bodily pleasure your ability is limited and once that pleasure principle kind of leaves your scheme of things you leaves your mindset you feel there is no need to be loyal to any of the other social paraphernalia surrounding it whether it is a family situation whether it is a marriage situation whether it is when being part of a nation community doing a particular job trying to be a good citizen so all of these are kind of threatened by this myopic understanding of who we are and how much pleasure we are entitled to to life but as you rightly said if we allow the duty principle to also play its role the reverse would happen we could be much more contented much more satisfied in fact much more resilient because then we could be understanding that apart from pleasure i also need life to teach me how i should face my miseries my calamities my reverses my failures that's true and then if we if one has that sense of uh, responsibility then when then we can also look at nuances see the modern lens might look at this is this is arranged marriages are like anathema you know they are so old fashioned things are just arranged for you we might consider them to be like black and we might consider that uh, i people choosing their own arrangements the law marriages as, as something which is white but instead of that we see that there are values which are underlying which are important and how those values apply in today's world there is always a shade of gray like you said earlier if selfishness uh, comes into anything then it becomes a problem so in the tradition also like many times arranged marriages now are more of business propositions and then that is also not very healthy so we ultimately each individual has to take the responsibility for for ensuring that the things work and how they will work in particular situations that may vary from person to person and the idea that i think you also wanted to mention this point that 
in the past all we can't stereotype the past also it was not that all marriages in the past were entirely what we would call as arranged marriages yeah. you know some samita mentioned different kinds of marriages also then you would like to add a few words about that mm. in the sense uh, i think there is a puranic verse which talks of eight different types of marriages one is where uh, the prospective bride and groom they are like typical arranged one secondly the girl is allowed to disclose her mind that she would like to marry someone and then the discussion takes place or there is they just come together and decide that is a gandharva marriage or the girl is kidnapped because her family may not allow so how krishna kidnapped rukmini so that is that is another uh, kind of marriage uh, which is mentioned so many of them are culturally simply non compliant now <laughs> we just need to hmm. read them and kind of just uh, okay we may amuse ourselves oh this is how people were getting married at that time that time okay. but i would certainly feel that uh, bhakti wisdom or vedic wisdom it does not leave us uh, bereft of wisdom bereft of a skill set to understand the marriage situation today maybe we cannot have that kind of uh, duty sense uh, installed in our generation but that is a duty which we have to do but when we say like i expect you to do your duty there is a reverse thing also happening like a simple example the governor of new york state he got a emmy award for coming maybe 100 plus times on tv and his tv appearances made him win that emmy award now emmy is not given for politicians but the tv presentation was so effective and some of the lines which are still very popular on youtube is he is telling his first responders his medical staff i will not tell you to do anything which i won't do myself i will not tell you to go to any area where i will not go myself so people say that was the one which kind of reassured them that although there is a pandemic although it's a horrible situation we have a proper leader we have somebody who has all the leadership skill sets in the right place so similarly the point i'm trying to make is whenever a elder tells somebody that i am doing this because it is your duty to do this to the family when that person sees that this that somebody who's telling him or her their duty is also fulfilling his duty or her duty then it is much easier to have that transmission going from one generation to another yeah i think that's a good point so there is that means there is there is you know the uh, appearance and there is the substance and first of all there is has to be something if if it seems to be very self centered then it's a problem and then if it even if it is not self centered if it is not selfishly driven but if it appears selfishly driven then it can also be a problem so we need both the appearance and the substance with respect to the same new york thing with respect to politics there are always different opinions so new york has the maximum casualties in all of america with respect to covid so that same uh, that same general that same uh, head's decision to send elderly people uh, with covid positive to old age homes that caused the maximum deaths in spite uh, in all of america and without those nursing home deaths i think everything would have been uh, the casualties would have been less than one third of what they actually were so you now sometimes so i could turn this example around and say make the same point that something can get glamorized because it appears good even if the substance is not there and i think that has happened to some extent with respect to love marriages in today's world where it's a lot of focus on the initials but not so much focus on the subsequent and then that's why the longevity is much lesser so like you said that if both are there if there is a sense of responsibility so those who are talking about responsibility they themselves demonstrate that responsibility then 
then it becomes relatively easier for things to work so would like to summarize i don't have any new points uh, that yeah so broadly i think it was we discussed three main things first is that that why something like arranged marriages seems questionable to us in today's world that's because of the problem of, because we in a sense overvalue autonomy or even i don't say overvalue we value autonomy to an extent which it was not in the past in the past society was much more structured and people were driven with a greater sense of duty not just with respect to their marriages but with respect to their other relationship with their respect to their professions with respect to their roles in society and there is no overarching evidence that the that the lack of autonomy itself crippled people people survived in the past also and uh, humanity has continued through times which were tougher than what they were today so the sense of duty and responsibility uh, where the focus was more on say having children and continuing on once having building a life building a family that helped people to move on in their lives even when certain things were not available for them uh, like autonomy so this was the first point the second point was largely that how what made arranged marriages uh, work in the past was that they were a, that there is a understanding that you know we ourselves may not know uh, everything that is necessary for us to know for taking wise decisions so then if, if others who are maybe more experienced wiser than us if they take a decision then maybe that will be in our better interests and the idea of looking at the past with respect rather than uh, some kind of uh, dismissive attitude that is what defines our differentiate between modern and pre modern times so then therein we discussed um, some more specifics about how there's a over emphasis on the starting of things but what is what about sustaining of those things so how a relationship starts is important but how what values are required for sustaining it that initial pleasure may not last for very long and then one has to find out a higher purpose that will help that helps people to sustain and toward the end we discussed about nuances that rather than treating things as black and white overall if if we all learn a sense of ethos of responsibility then we can take things forward and we can actually learn to uh, <clears throat> learn to live and learn to make the choices or make the decisions that can help us negotiate through life in today's world any additional points are left out no oh, that was very nice so thank you very much thank, thank you, you. hey krishna we'll meet again hari krishna okay.